such a pleasure being here in Auckland today. I'm almost 15 years back since my last travel to Auckland. So I love the city, I love the people. It's great to see such a vibrant data engineering community grows here and the tech scene. And I'm really curious to learn more about what it is that you're building. But let's take a stroll back in history. And maybe for some of us, it's not going to be that historic experience, actually. So let's go back into 1950s when mainframe was born. Back in that days, we're still using some of their systems in our financial institutions. If you work with a mainframe system, raise your hand. It's fine. OK, you've got this. You can do it. Uh, <laughs> so back in the days, what we did, we ingested punch cards. We didn't have exactly data pipelines, but today we're finally realizing that we need to move data from place to place, even outside of our mainframe, or to insert it into our mainframe. A couple of years later, uh, we start having something called the PC, right? 1960s, we start having these devices available, mostly for professional, not home usage. And we start building something like more applications, perhaps, if you will. Um, things evolved. We didn't have any databases back in the day beyond what we had on our own personal devices. So each computer came with a disk, and that disk became our database, essentially, if we wish to. We start having things like terminal, maybe a green screen, if you remember these. Up until this guy came and kind of brought Dell into, into the world with new other capabilities that kind of spread out the, uh, the ability for us to purchase our home uh, laptops um, as well. Later, we start seeing things like Visual Basics. Anyone here remembers of seeing in their past Visual Basic? Yes. We start having this known uh, thing related to the new evolution of web development. Uh, the industry was growing. We saw a huge explosion uh, in data. We discovered the web. Web seemed like it's going to be the big thing ahead of us. Um, and we were right back in the days, the days where it's 2000, Netscape was alive, and everyone started creating their own blogs uh, and blog platform. And that brought it actually to an interesting pattern that still exists in some of, uh, some of the organizations. This is the client-server pattern where we have presentation tier, business tier, and data tier. And this is when we actually introduced ETL, because now we moved away from having a database on our own devices, on our own laptops, and actually introduced 100 da different databases that we need to communicate with through a full-blown ETL process. Um, some companies are still using this pattern. This pattern still uh, works, but it's considered a little bit more outdated if you ask some of the people. Uh, but again, this introduces us to ability to actually query 100 different databases to follow our business logic. A couple of years yet later, social media emerged. Social media, smartphones, and the amount of data that we start producing exploded. And what exploded means? It means we enter the era of big data. Big data era started, we start talking about things like Hadoop, MapReduce, Spark, Apache Hive, um, HDFS. If you don't know all these courses, that's fine. You don't have to, because we're way past these days. Um, but it is important to understand that social media and the ability to have smartphones actually introduced more data into our lives, because now everything is tracked, everything is measured, um, and we produce data in a huge, huge pace. So if you go back all the way to mainframe, to client and server, and to something that we call the Apache Kafka, it's actually there's an interesting line that goes in between the years. Because throughout these time, we always needed to ingest data and move data in between different systems and from place to place. Um, Apache Kafka, anyone here heard about Apache Kafka? Nice. Uh, Apache Kafka wasn't born in 2011, but it was open source back in the days. It was actually burning, burning other places in the world that needed to move data from place to place. So the whole concept and paradigm of that wasn't new to our industry. Just the fact that we can do it in a much simplified way uh, was what got open source into our systems. And that kind of brings me to the next phase of innovation that we're seeing, and this is around data streaming. And there's a big question of what is data streaming? How do we even take a look at that? What is the philosophical way? And there's also the practical way. So 
before I'm jumping into the practical way, I would love for all of you to actually take a deep look into what you're doing today and kind of see the connection between the physical and the digital world that we have. This is where we know now that every company is becoming a software company. Because essentially what we have today is our healthcare systems are becoming digitized, um, our governance systems are fully becoming digitized. Today if we have uh, the driver license, right, you have an app on your phone, you don't necessarily have to have a physical card anymore. Um, our financial system has long been completely digitized and actually they're a software company more than a financial company. Um, even I spent some time in Perth, uh, thanks to the great organizers of this conference, and I've learned more about mining. When I say mining, I don't mean mining coins, although in the beginning I did thought, oh, you're mining coins. No, it's, it's actual physical mining. Um, and they have uh, full blast uh, solutions around software and IoT devices where they are doing data streaming and kind of pushing the limits on what they can with their IoT devices and their carts and, and their physical buckets actually being translated into actual uh, data pipelines that they can make decisions in real time and improve their operations. So even our mining companies, not mining coins, are becoming a software company at the end of the day. So we want to be able to build a system. We want to be able to find value in the system that we build because at the end of the day, we need to go back and report to our bosses, our managers, uh, our customers that we build that thing for them and that generated the value that they expected. So how do we go about it as data engineers? We need to understand what data we have, where it exists, what a data contract that we want to achieve, right? Maybe a data model that we want to build following that data contract. Uh, we want to be able to move the data from place to place because we want our systems to be connected. Uh, we want to be able to respond in time and have freshness to our data in some of the cases. So essentially we want to be able to answer some of these kind of like, it feels like a long list of a lot of use cases, but we do want to be able to leverage data to answer all these use cases. For example, we need to protect our systems. So fraud detection, cybersecurity become prevalent in everything that we do. We want to make sure we are detecting anomalies in real time. We have IoT sensor data that tells us what happens in, in our minings. We want to know humidity, we want to know temperature, or what happens in other facilities. We want to be able to answer, to collect that data in real time, and give an answer as, fa as close as to real time as well. Because every minute means that we can lose millions of dollars, and that becomes a big burden. Sometimes some of us will build marketing intelligence platform or inventory platform, which means we want to know what happens in our systems in real time. We want to do product analysis. If I get a review back into my product, I want to be able to take action on that. If it's a good review, thumbs up. If it's a bad review, maybe I want to connect with the customers. I want to improve my customer experience. I want them to believe that I have a reliable solution, and if my solution is not reliable, there are people there that cares and can answer back. Um, log analytics, some of us build software for production, right? We know that our software produce logs. We want to be able to analyze these logs in real time. We want to be able to flag an alert. Yes, sometimes we wake up in the middle of the night because that beeper bipped and uh, we have to check what happened in production. And, but all of these systems happen in real time. We don't want to have a downtime and lonely as an after effect wake up and kind of, you know, figured out that that customer got really, really upset and that our system wasn't functioning for many hours. And lastly, especially the folks working with um, mainframe here or multiple connecting multiple systems, you know about cloud database migration and the need to move data from side to side. I see you nodding, thank you, <laughs> appreciate it. Uh, and the need, the need to move data from side to side in between our different systems in order to do something about it. So that's kind of like where CDC change data capture really comes to, to play with all of these. Um, these are two books that I wrote. Don't buy them. There's another one but <laughs> coming soon, I promise, <laughs> about data streaming platform, which I think is going to be super interesting. Um, these two are cool. They talk about the machine learning in the batch world, the, the deep, the depth into the analytics world and uh, distributed uh, data systems, but not streaming, uh, which I believe streaming is the future. So. Uh, a little bit about me, I wrote books, I managed two wonderful teams, um, my background is in the big data, dreaded field, and machine learning and scale, and in the last year I invested more and more into streaming because I see that world evolve, 
And I work for a company uh, named Confluent to actually build the data streaming solutions for our customers. And today I'm going to share some of the insights that we've learned as, as we did the work. So let's talk about infrastructure and one of the things that we need. At a high level, we want to have four different pillars in our, in our architecture. We want to be able to stream data. We want to be able to process the data. We want to be able to connect the data in between our systems. And lastly, the most dreaded one, we want to be able to govern the data. Uh, and potentially not as an after effect, we potentially make it a little bit more fun and engaging. So what is stream? Stream is, you can think about it as events that comes into my system constantly, right? An event has to have the what and has to have the when. So we need to have some notifications that this thing happened and some state. You can think about it as IoT, right? Internet of Things, I have device, temperature, humidity. You can think about it as business process, something has changed right now. So we want to bring that back. You can think about it as user interaction, someone bought or someone went into my e-commerce, bought something, I want to actually go back and update that where I need to update it, or any microservices output that I have, any application that creates this event. At the bare minimum, we need a key and we need value for our events. So you can imagine how it all becomes and turns into a log, a log of events that's constantly being streamed into my system. And I want this log to be immutable because immutability gives me the power to have multiple people, actually multiple application, taking back and consuming that information from the log. So what happens? How do we do that? Messages are being added at the end of that immutable infinite log of events. And then we're adding headers, we're adding timestamp into the value. So now we're starting to call it messages. Messages can be divided into topics. For example, if I have an e-commerce, I can have clicks, order customers, and I can have this infinite amount of uh, data events that comes into my, into my topics. Um, and also I want to be able to partition it because I want to have fast access to that data so I can take that data and partition and split it across multiple physical machines that I have to have the different guarantees um, as well. And as you can imagine, this is kind of like the backbones of what Kafka cluster is, where I have at the top someone that produces that message, produces this IoT, uh, output or any output from a microservices. I have my Kafka clusters with my topics and partitions, and then I have consumers at the bottom, applications to take that information and consume it later on. So let's take another look into the producer-consumer specifically. So we know that messages are being added at the end of the log. This is when we're producing data. And we know that we are able to consume the data giving a specific offset so we can take in a specific offset and scan up to a specific point in time in a sequential matter. Why sequential matter? Because the way we're writing the information to disk, once it's sequential, sequential, it gives me a fast access to that information because I don't have to move the needle on the physical disk uh, that jumps. And what's the benefit of that is that I can have multiple consumers. For example, I have Sally that reads from some specific place. I have Fred who wants to read some older information that I have. And I have Rick that's somewhere in between Sally and Fred, and both of them get access to the data and they can start scanning it. And this is how Kafka is being linearly scales, because we have the producer at the, at the top, the Kafka cluster in the middle, and then the consumer at the bottom. And that means I can have as many broker machines as I need to support my topics and partitions. I can have as many producers as I need to produce more and more data, as many consumer, because all my data is immutable, and essentially I have zero bottleneck with this architecture. How do we make sure that no data is being lost, right? This is probably the biggest fear of all data engineers, making sure we're not deleting that specific table, we have enough copies, auditing, our mechanism is fully bulletproof. So fault tolerance becomes really important when we're talking about any tool that we're using for data. And so Kafka uses replication. What it does, it has a leader, it defines who is the leader for some machine, and then it's replicated into another machine that we're calling it a follower. So how does it look like? Assuming we have multiple partitions, multiple topics, as you can see here, you can see in the bright orange we have the leaders, and the other colors we have the followers. And let's assume that Broker 4, Broker 4 is a machine that has compute and storage in it, so let's assume that Broker 4 is now failing, and that means that I'm going to lose partition 4 for topic X. So what happens here, just in that failure moment, we have a replica that is going to take over 
that machine failure. So this we call leader election process that takes place behind the scene, and then the data is being copied later on. So once this, this machine fails, the data, the data is being copied into, you can see, the broker two, and broker two is now becoming the leader uh, of that. Best practice, always replicate the data three times. It's in the configuration. Please don't change it. Even if you want to save costs, three times mean you, statistically you're not going to lose any data. Um, please keep it as is, or make sure it's configured to three. Um, so let's take a look at the big picture. Um, I can have any external systems. I can have a producer to take the data, bring it back into my Kafka brokers, and then a consumer to consume it. Within my Kafka brokers, I have the topic, the partition, segment, uh, and so on that helps me manage the data in there. Let's take a look a little bit deeper into the internal of the producers. So the producers in Kafka are written in Java. So in Java, we have a process of serializing, deserializing of the data. So what happens with the data, it gets a producer record. The data is being serialized and partitioned into my topic. Now, I want you to remember that this point when we're doing the serialize, because later on we're going to talk about more things related to that. And then there's a mechanism of retreat, retry if I need to, up until failure. On the consumer side, I have something very interesting. I have this pool loop that I have in there, and that pool loop enables me to make sure I have event guarantees. What are event guarantees? I can make sure that my data is being read exactly once, at least once, or at most once. Now, it's going to impact my commit offset that I'm doing here, but if I do have data that I need to make sure I'm reading at most once, this is where I'm configuring it in my consumer to make sure I am reading all the data as I wish to, uh, to read it. And this is cover streams. Um, next thing, we want to talk about processing. Processing is how do I take this data stream in real time and actually add some mechanism to process the data. So now we're actually moving from thinking about data as streams into thinking about data as an unbounded context, or if you wish, a dynamic, unbounded dynamic table. So we know events are being injected perpetually. Uh, till event producer stops or something happened in the system, but eventually the, the way the system built is to conti continuously have that information coming in. And so we constantly append new rows into the data. We think in terms of historical data, this will be my bounded stream, and then what now and what's in the future, that becomes my unbounded stream. I don't know what's coming in, but I need to be ready to process that continuously. And the ability to constant that uh, continuously means that I want to create something called a job graph. Because I want to take this data and I want to run some filtering, I want to run some join, I want to run some merge. So this translates actually into a query plan, right? That is my job graph at the end of the day. So what is my job graph at a high level topology? I have operators and I have connectors. When data comes in from my sources, it's coming in parallel. This is where I'm getting all the data in, either from other uh, from my Kafka or for mainframe if you wish or Snowflake or any other database that I work with and I want to start streaming that data in uh, into my system that comes in in parallel, very efficient. Um, and then I want to do some operations on top of it. For example, I want to run some filtering and that approach is named forward. So that's forward processing now, I'm running some filtering on top of that data um, and I want to do something with forward. The third one is Repartition. So repartition happens, and this is considered more of an expensive operation that we do. Repartition of the data, I want to group it by specific color, I want to do any operation on top of that. That means that now my data is being shuffled into the right machine in order to execute on top of that request specifically. This is why I always want to filter and want to do the rest of the, the operations before I'm doing any repartition operation specifically. And all the way at the, at the end, we're going to have something called rebalance. So if I did repartition, for example, for colors, and I have now the, the blue and the yellow, I want to run some count operations that's considered a rebalancing, or summary is also considered a rebalancing operations that we do that gives me the final count, which later on I can take that data and sync it into Kafka if I wish, or save it into iceberg tables, or Parquet, or Avro, however you work next with your systems. So this is a little bit about how the operation works. And now let's talk about the engines. 
In the industry, we have two high-level engines that people are usually going into to, to, in order to do uh, real-time data processing. One is Flink. Um, this is just the high level, gets all the information in, produce customer and better customer experience in real time uh, backend operations. And the second one is Apache Spark, structured streaming, if you heard of it. Similar thing, Connect has a good, very good connector to Kafka and uh, bring that information into console and memory. It can stick it into any system that connects with Spark. Now, what is the high level difference between these two? The high level difference between these two actually connects to how the API is structured for us developers. So you can see on the Flink side, the API is very much focused on streaming. You can see all the way at the bottom, the very lowest abstraction uh, possible. Uh, we have the stateful stream processing that actually manage my whole cluster with having stream in mind. Uh, and the big difference here is if Flink comes out of the box, it has a stateful, uh, we can build stateful stream processing, which gives us a very strong um, edge on top of other open source tools that are available in the industry. And all the way at the top, we have SQL. So you can imagine we can write SQL query that will continuously run forever and ever. We don't need to kick them off every five minutes or something like that. They're always on. And table API uh, that helps us build anything that we want with Java and Python specifically. On the other side, we have Apache Spark. Apache Spark at the very core, there's data sources that bring information, but what we actually have is the resilient distributed data sets, RDD, at the bottom. It really speaks to a more of a machine learning batch processing operations that we want to do, uh, kind of like when we're kicking off a job every fixed amount of time. On top of that, we have data frames that have self optimization and at the top, we have different APIs that caters to different people inside the organization. Um, I'm gonna speed up a little bit some of the things. Uh, we're gonna jump into the uh, anatomy of the Flink cluster. So similar to how other distributed cluster works, we have the job manager, the Flink program, and the task manager. They all work in coordination in order to actually achieve the task that we want. You can imagine how I have different machines. Task manager, usually you'll see it called TM uh, in the documentations and they do the task and the process that they are required. This is a little bit about how the chain of operators actually looks like. Once I have a source, I have a map, key, a key by, and, and sync all the way to the bottom. Um, I'm gonna speed things up a little bit. I'm gonna jump into dynamic tables. So Flink treated our data stream as a dynamic table, kind of like the stream to table duality that I talked about, and it can do two things for us. One is append. And the other one is it can be in do update as well. Uh, and the update actually gives us the strong mechanism. You can see here I have Mary as event coming into the system, and then I have Bob as an event coming into the system, but then Mary pops up again. So what the, my query does is actually go back and update the CNT to be two now. So this is kind of like how the, uh, the ability, the stateful mechanism really works behind the scenes and helped me speed up a lot of these processes. Um, Let's talk a little bit about Windows. Windows are an event that comes over time. That means that I can have three different events with Flink. One is tumbling, it's very specific. I'm moving from one, event, one uh, window to the next. The next one is gonna be sliding window. So sliding window is really great when I have GPS or I wanna calculate something on a specific group. For example, I have multiple antennas and I wanna know how many people are actually connecting with, with this antenna as a specific place. And so I wanna be able to have a, a sliding window in there in actually to calculate this information. And that really critical for us uh, for IoT devices in real time. And last one is the session window. So session windows, what it means that my application is always up and actually measures for how long I didn't get any event into my system. So if I have peak of information, peak in events coming in, this is where I can leverage that session uh, windows. We talked about stream, we talked about processing. Let's touch a little bit of connect. Our system never lives in silos. We always have to connect system from place to place. All these great tools give me some connector capabilities. Uh, my recommendation and what I've seen also uh, working for different companies, also uh, supporting uh, customers, is actually Kafka is probably the better thing that we have for writing, for having a connect. Uh, a lot of the people that I worked with actually when they started leveraging Kafka Connect moved from trying to write one single connect in six months uh, and reduce that to two weeks, which was fantastic to see. There are about 120 different connectors built in out of the box. 
So if you're looking at connecting your system and you already have Kafka in place, really highly recommend leveraging uh, these capabilities. And lastly, we cannot really uh, finish without talking about governance. And governance always feel like, oh, why, why, do, I, why do I even you know, care? Uh, but we do care, uh, and we want to be able to add some governance into our stream processing as they go and flow into my system. So this is when schema registry really, really helps, because I want to have my schema, I want to make sure it's in line with what I expect it to be, and so schema registry can help me enforce all this cycle uh, in between my stream processing producer and consumer. And not only enforcing schema, actually I can start building also quality rules directly in there. So if you remember, I spoke a little bit about the serializer and I said, hey, remember that? This is where the serializer shines. This is where I can have, for example, a message uh, that it's not null and start validating the data that flows into my system, address the necessities that I put in. If not, I can set it into a dead letter queue, deal queue, it's a best practice uh, that can take that data and actually sync it into a different Kafka topic so it doesn't harm my system downstream. Second thing that I can do is I can actually transform. So if I have some data transformation, something changed, I'm now connecting, or I have new versions of information flows in, I can create this type of transform and give it the dedicated expression together uh, as well during my consumer side, during my Kafka deserialization phase. Yes, and this is a little bit how we're building the, some of the best practices of really building a data streaming infrastructure. We need to have the four pillars, stream processing, connect and governance. And with that, I'm gonna finish. Thank you so much, really appreciate you all. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'll be right back. Thank you.